Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here. I'd like to provide you some new information related to my work on dysbiosis in human disease. As many of you know, in 2014 I published Functional Inflammology as a 700-page textbook, and I published an excerpt of that called Dysbiosis in Human Disease, which obviously just focused on dysbiosis. The most recent and highest manifestation of that work will be published in Naturopathic Rheumatology, version 3.5. As some of you may know, I have the responsibility every year to update and make available my rheumatology work because it's used in some medical schools as a required text. Previously, this work was published under the name Integrative Rheumatology, but this year I'm specifically publishing it for two naturopathic schools right now, and for that reason I've decided to change the name to Naturopathic Rheumatology. Some of the information I show you on the next slide actually will come from that book. This slide, as I'm sure you've seen before, just represents my copyright and trademark information. What I'm providing you with this video in particular, other than just the conceptual update, is to actually to provide you access to more videos. Uh, this video placeholder, so to speak, or location, was originally designed to hold one video and what I've done more recently is I've created an album called Dr. Vasquez on Dysbiosis and Related Considerations that you can access at my Vimeo channel with the following password. When you do that, you'll not only get the originally intended video, but you'll have access to what will ultimately be a whole library of videos on specifically the topic of dysbiosis. Let's take a look at one of my more recent diagrams on dysbiosis. This will be published for the first time in Naturopathic Rheumatology version 3.5, which I just mentioned. So what I want you to do in this diagram, uh, as you're looking at this diagram, is just focus on the four corners. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to emphasize different types of dysbiosis by location, and then actually show you how different diseases are represented in what ultimately will form a grid here. So let's take a quick look at this. Let's look at exogenous viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus and human papillomavirus and parvovirus B19 and cytomegalovirus. We call those exogenous viruses. Then in the bottom left-hand corner, we're also going to talk about endogenous viruses. These are the viruses that are permanently encoded within the human DNA, and those are called human endogenous retroviruses. I contrast those, obviously, with the exogenous viruses, such as the ones we're all familiar with, like herpes simplex type 1 and 2, and herpes zoster, for example. Then in the upper right-hand corner, we can see bacteria, and in the bottom right, we can talk about bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are a very obvious uh, exemplification of what I've talked about for several years, which is microbial dysbiosis. So this is actually dysbiosis within another microbe. And in this case, the part that I focus on in the book is to talk about viral infections of gastrointestinal bacteria. So gastrointestinal bacteria themselves can be imbalanced, but even within those bacterial populations, those bacteria themselves can be infected by viruses, and those viruses are now increasingly believed to have uh, negative uh, clinical effects, especially in our autoimmune patients. So now that we've looked at the landscape, and obviously other microbes could fit in here as well, you'll notice I have no mention here of yeast, uh, fungi, other parasites like Endolimex nana, for example, or Blastocystis hominis. Those haven't even made it onto this screen yet. I'm just trying to show you what I think is most common and most relevant most of the time in most patients, especially, again, for most diseases that we see in clinical practice. So let's look, for example, at rheumatoid arthritis. I think the tightest correlations with rheumatoid arthritis and dysbiosis are clearly bacterial. Uh, I've certainly seen that in my own clinical practice, and that's what the research consistently represents, whether it's nasopharyngeal, gastrointestinal, or genitourinary. Psoriasis, the same thing. In my opinion, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis are two variants of the same underlying themes. If you look at the data on those two conditions, as I've done in my books and my work, it's very consistent. Those are, if, if you didn't have the name, in any given article, for example, you could easily think that you're talking about one condition or the other. They're very, very similar. Now, of course, psoriasis has some skin manifestations, 
which are the superficial manifestation of what's occurring underneath. But with the exception of the uh, skin uh, component, uh, psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis are very, very similar. Wegener's granulomatosis, uh, clearly but not exclusively dominated by Staphylococcus aureus bacteria. Reactive arthritis and the spondyloarthropathies are generally what I would call bacteria dominant. Ulcerative colitis, bacterial dysbiosis with mitochondriopathic hydrogen sulfide. Crohn's disease is actually a little more closely related to bacteriophage imbalance. For example, if you look at the uh, intestinal lumen of uh, patients with Crohn's disease, they actually have double the number of bacteriophages compared to normal healthy people. Multiple sclerosis, definitely a combination of bacterial infection, especially chlamydophila pneumoniae, with uh, exogenous viruses. Sjogren's, clearly linked to both Epstein-Barr virus, especially since an article was just published on this last month uh, in Arthritis and Rheumatism, showing very clear association between Epstein-Barr virus and uh, Sjogren's syndrome. Helicobacter pylori continues to be a major player in the clinical spectrum of Sjogren's syndrome. If we look at scleroderma, very tightly associated with cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, parvovirus B19, and helicobacter pylori. So that's an interesting disease that has very clear associations with exogenous viruses, in this case three different viruses, as well as bacteria. If we look at lupus, the strongest associations there are Epstein-Barr virus and these human endogenous retroviruses that I mentioned before, and a little bit of bacterial influence, again, probably pinpointed toward Staphylococcus aureus. So that's a way of beginning to understand how dysbiosis can be interconnected and how different levels or different balances or different combinations of dysbiosis can result in different clinical manifestations. But again, all of these, as I'm sure you appreciate, are prototypic autoimmune conditions, just different patterns of expression of that underlying dysbiotic and metabolic inflammation. So I think that you'll, obviously, since you're watching this, share some interest in these topics. Uh, again, published in 2014, uh, Functional Inflammology, an excerpt of that published as dys Dysbiosis in Human Disease, most recently updated and expanded into Naturopathic Rheumatology 3.5. Thank you for your interest, and again, please access the complete album of videos, not simply one video, but eventually it'll be a library of videos on this topic of dysbiosis. Thank you much, and please stay in touch.